Our next speaker is not a postdoc, but he was a PhD student here. He's now a professor at UBC. Uh, Adam Saunders and I have cooperated on a number of projects. We wrote a book together, Wired for in uh, Innovation, uh, some articles in the, S in the Sloan Management Review. And he's uh, partnering with me on this project I talked about this morning about measuring GDP and measuring the economy better. Please join me in welcoming Adam Saunders. Hi, so uh, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, so my name is Adam Saunders, um, and I'm from the University of British Columbia uh, in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and yeah, it's a tremendous pleasure uh, to be back here at MIT uh, to present my uh, latest work with Eric, uh, New Measures of the US Economy. Um, so over the past year, uh, we've been working on an interesting literature review, uh, exploring what's been going on uh, with New Measures of GDP. Um, so I'm excited to tell you about what we found um, and then some of the future directions um, that we'd like to take. So on this one slide um, is really kind of the whole reason why I've been so passionate uh, about undertaking this research. According to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, um, so the official agency in charge of measuring GDP and other statistics of the economy, the information sector makes up only 4 to 5% of the US economy. So as a share of the economy, it's about the same size as it was 30 years ago in 1986. Right? It really hasn't changed much at all. The information sector, including things like telecom, movies, music, television, information services, search engines, all of that put together, roughly 4 to 5 percent of the economy, the same as it was in 1986. How is this possible? Right? Don't we have more access to information right, than we ever did before? Right? The answer, of course, isn't about quantity. It's about price. So I'm showing you one example here um, from the music industry. Actually, this comes from the, uh, the Sloan Management Review article that uh, Eric and I wrote together. Um, so although I'm showing you data here from 2004 to 2008, um, really you could actually go back really 15 years um, and see an even more dramatic shift um, as consumers right, move away from buying music on CDs, cassettes, and vinyl records. Right? So that, those physical media for music have almost entirely disappeared. And then of course um, they've been replaced by you know, digital downloads from iTunes and streaming. Um, and what's interesting is though, even though the quantity of music, um, had, you know, the total amount of music that we're consuming in the United States, right, is, if anything, certainly much more than it was in 1999, revenue, total revenue, for example, um, in the music industry um, is declining rapidly. So here you are seeing um, just this time period, the sum going from about 12 billion to about 8 billion. Um, you could go back to 1999 and actually see a similar trend. I think back then it, it peaked at around 15 billion. Um, and by um, 2014, um, it was about half that at 7 billion. So you have the recording industry disappearing from the GDP statistics. And of course, that's uh, an industry that has prices. Um, so this is similar to uh, the slide that Eric showed you this morning. Um, you have a whole plethora of digital goods that, of course, weren't around um, back in 1986, 1996, or even many of them even 10 years ago. Um, and so none of these goods, or almost none of them, really are making any kind of digital footprint in GDP. Um, and so this is the kind of, of area, this is a phenomenon um, that's growing in size. Um, and Eric and I feel at least this is just, you know, getting too large um, to ignore. So I think Eric showed the growth of Wikipedia over time. Here's another comparison to just give you the sense of how large Wikipedia is to Britannica. So they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, this is a picture. Um, representing three billion words. 
Um, you have the size of Britannica up there that could fill about two or three shelves. Um, you have, if you printed out all of English Wikipedia at three billion words, there's a, uh, a person right there. You could be floor to ceiling, about 13 bookshelves. So that would be about 2,000 volumes of Britannica sized volumes if you printed out um, all of Wikipedia. So again, it gives you a sense of the amount of information that's out there. We're very good, um, or the BEA is very good, the official statistics are very good at quantifying the top, um, but Wikipedia, especially being a nonprofit, um, is literally virtually invisible um, in GDP. So I think Eric um, this morning um, gave you the definition of GDP, so I'm just showing you up here again as a reminder. Um, GDP measures the value of final goods and services produced in the United States in a given period of time. Most of it is based on market transactions, cash transactions that you can see. Um, but there are some things that are imputed in GDP. So that is that the BEA recognizes that um, there is value, right? Because technically the, the definition of GDP is not how much cash was exchanged, but what was really the value of production. Um, so owner-occupied housing is the largest uh, component. So that is that if you rent an apartment and you're paying your rent, of course, that's going to be in GDP. That's not controversial. If you're sitting in your house and you own your house, even if there's no money changing hands, you own it outright, uh, the BEA um, imputes that and says you're benefiting from the services of living in your house. So even though we have over here, a whole set of goods that are just, let's say, invisible or they have a zero price, that doesn't necessarily mean right, that, that there isn't, that at least theoretically, right, they shouldn't even be included in GDP. Um, if we could measure their value effectively, if we knew how much value people were getting out of Google searches, YouTube videos, right, there's no conceptual reason why we couldn't include that in a measure of GDP. It's just that the BEA, um, you know, being a government agency, has a tremendous amount of integrity, right? And so things that, um, you know, that can be, you know, quantified quite well and measured from census surveys will be included um, in measures of GDP. Um, but new kinds of phenomenon, um, they tend to be very conservative, and so they put an estimate of zero. Um, but just because um, you know, they're the government and they have the reasons and there's a lot of integrity there. One of the nice things as an academic um, is that we can afford to be a little bit more bold um, and try to go out and, and estimate this value. So I'll skip this in the interest of time um, and go right to here. Um, so this is another illustration here, um, kind of a different way of looking at it. Um, I think Eric showed you some some uh, graphs this morning. Um, so just to put a picture around what I've been discussing, the orange uh, rectangle, um, that we can measure pretty well um, in, in GDP. So that's price times quantity. Of course, the blue rectangle is consumer surplus. Um, the gray rectangle is dead weight loss. And as you introduce these information goods and price goes to zero, right, you have society being a whole lot better off. Um, but of course, uh, and I'll just go back again, show you. So this orange rectangle here, so think about the music industry, that's what we could measure before. And so that measurable part of GDP basically disappears, even though we could be tremendously better off. Um, and so as we see more and more of these information goods in the economy, um, Eric and I see this as a, as a phenomenon that just becomes too large to just assume that it's zero. Um, so I'm going to cover uh, three different past approaches um, that academics have taken to measuring these digital goods, um, tell you about some of their merits, tell you some of their limitations, and then finally take you over to the approach that Eric covered a bit this morning and choice experiments, why we think that that might be a promising avenue uh, to measuring the value of these goods. 
So one of the approaches has been based on internet access fees. Other approaches have used advertising revenue. And finally, another approach um, on a paper actually that, that Eric co-authored um, was using time use. All different ways to try to get at some of the value of these information goods that have zero price and so therefore zero impact on GDP. So uh, Greenstein and McDevitt um, used um, the prices that people were paying for internet service to look at when broadband was uh, widely deployed um, in the United States um, in the early 2000s, how much value um, that was creating in GDP. Um, so they, they found that there was about $40 billion that, that, that broadband um, that, uh, that it was worth and that it created about $10 billion worth of new GDP in 2006. Um, so when you compare these numbers to the size of all of US GDP, they're actually quite small. Um, and the reason why they're so small is that their approach was carefully done, um, very accurate, but it was based entirely around the principle that the value that people were getting out uh, from the internet was related to how much they were paying for internet services. And so um, our hypothesis is that consumers, the, the value that people are getting from the internet is vastly out of proportion to whatever they're paying for. So that's why we think these numbers are a bit small. Another approach um, by two economists actually working in the government, um, uh, Leonard Nakamura and uh, Rachel Soloveitchik, one works for the Federal Reserve, the other uh, for the Bureau of Economic Analysis, um, proposed that for the value of free online media that we could use advertising um, revenue as a proxy for that value. And that in a sense it's like a, a barter or a trade. So. Um, let's say advertisers were spending $50 billion um, to support you know, online media. Let's say it's an advertisement appearing on the Huffington Post. That, that proxies for the value of that content. Um, and that number, again, um, is, is fairly small uh, relative to the size of all of GDP. Um, and while again, while it's a very carefully done analysis, we see it being incomplete in at least a couple of ways. Um, one being that of course there's a lot of content that even if it's supported by advertisements, advertisements aren't always capturing um, when people are using these goods. So if you do a Google search, right, there's some advertising, you know, keyword ads where if you don't click on the keyword ad, then no money changed hands. Um, and then of course if you, uh, let's say, watch a YouTube video and you get one of those advertisements that pop up before your video runs and then you click on the skip ad, um, again, no money changes hands. So this approach um, would miss, um, let's say, that kind of uh, online content. Um, and then of course there's all kinds of, of ad blocking extensions. So, um, I think in 2016, one estimate was that there was $20 billion worth of advertisements that were actually blocked. Um, I think the largest um, ad block extension has roughly 40 million users. So even if we proxied through advertising, we're missing, uh, of course, all of this revenue uh, this way as well. Um, and then of course, in addition to just the ad supported types of online goods. You have completely ad-free goods like Wikipedia, so such an approach would completely miss the value of Wikipedia in the economy. Um, or you also have, um, of course, a whole bunch of, of cross-subsidized goods. So Google Maps, for example, being subsidized by keyword searches. And so, um, Again, one estimate um, that Hal Varian um, has proposed in terms of the value of Google search engine was $120 billion to the economy. Um, and their advertising revenue um, back in 2011 was, was only $36 billion, um, relatively speaking. So there's a huge amount of value. Um, and that was you know, five years ago. That's, that's essentially being missed just by looking at advertising revenue. 
And then finally, another approach, right? So in addition to looking at how much people are spending on internet service or how much people are spending on advertising, another approach um, that uh, Eric um, used in a paper he co-authored uh, with Juhi O oh, looked at the amount of time that people were spending online. And so their estimates were, of course, much larger um, when you factor in how much time that people were spending online. So they estimated almost a trillion dollars for example, of, of surplus that people were getting um, from the internet when they used the amount of time that people were spending online rather than just how much money they were spending. Um, and not only was it almost a trillion dollars, but in terms of actually growing, it was uh, about $150 billion a year of growth. Um, and again, these are numbers from um, five years ago, so if anything, you can imagine how much larger they would be. And then when they compared it again to a money model, so a model um, that just looked at how much people were spending on access. It was vastly lower. Again, so um, just as uh, putting it all back in one picture, right? So we had, you know, internet access fees, advertising revenue, time use. So all of these methods, right, have some merit um, in terms of trying to value how much people are getting from all of these online services, but none of them were really going out and directly asking people you know, how much do you value Google searches, YouTube videos, Wikipedia articles? And so the, uh, the method that we're proposing um, and what we're excited about going forward, and, and Eric covered this a bit this morning, is you know, like a choice experiment, a more direct way to measure consumer surplus generated by digital goods. Um, so this would be one example of a, of a data collection card. This was from a, a credit card study. So this is a method that's been used in thousands of marketing studies um, where we're essentially varying the components of two different bundles slightly um, along with the price um, to get a sense at how much people might value individual components of that bundle. Um, so. Um, to conclude from what we've looked at over the last year, we see, of course, consumers assigning value vastly differently than what you'll find in GDP. Um, previous approaches that measure digital goods, you know, while there is merit to them, we still see as potentially a significant underestimate to how much they're actually worth. Um, we see, of course, consumer surplus being a much better measure of some of these free digital goods in the economy. And you know, we don't know how large this is, and we're really excited to see this going forward, but there could potentially be trillions of dollars worth of value from all of these goods that are right now being estimated in official statistics with a value of zero. So um, our next steps um, that we plan to continue this research is to use surveys and then perform conjoint analysis to try to get at this value in a much more direct way. So uh, thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure um, to, uh, to be back here at MIT, and I look forward to continuing this discussion. And we have just time for a question or two, if uh, someone wants to ask you. Bill? Um, what will motivate uh, the governments of the major economies to adopt a new measure how will it happen? Is it the OECD or G20? And it will t I assume it will take 10 years, right? And will it just layer on top of GDP? Interesting. So that's, that's a great question. Um, so governments are very, very conservative. Uh, the US government, or certainly the statistical agencies in the US are, are incredibly conservative because they have a lot of integrity. Um, and so just as an example, R&D, which had been sort of widely recognized by everybody, academics, businesses, as, as being considered investment, was only incorporated in the, in the main core accounts of the GDP as investment in 2013, almost 30 years, let's say, after people have been talking about R&D as investment. So I would say that for the government to try to incorporate these measures, that would, that would be kind of a, a nice long-term goal. That would be many, many years off. Um, Rather, there are precedents to kind of incorporating new interesting measures. So the BEA has a set of parallel accounts called satellite accounts that include kind of experimental measures of GDP. Um, they're kind of like what ifs if we did this. 
Um, so we could see, you know, we would see a progression being something like if, if, if this method worked well, um, potentially being created or incorporated as a satellite account um, before that would actually get incorporated in the core accounts. Great. One more question, I think, over there. Uh, Marshall. So in an economic sense, I still wonder if this still isn't even an underestimate for at least two reasons. One is the extent to which information serves an in intermediate good. Airbnb and Uber couldn't do what they do without information. And because they generate their own information, it's never transacted. So it's not an opportunity cost of time and it's never traded. The second reason is in many cases, information might be substituting for labor and I'm valuing the shorter time. Uh, for it. So rather than measuring opportunity cost of my time, I'm actually completely substituting out the time, and that whole block is going in exactly the opposite direction. It's the same reason that we don't measure code quality by number of lines of code. Sometimes a more efficient program is a, more, is a shorter program. So I think at least, how would you try to measure those two other cases where information is adding immense value, but never transacted, intermediate good, and swapping out for other goods? Hmm. Okay, so those are both excellent questions. Um, so in terms of intermediate goods, um, so within the GDP framework, um, intermediate goods tend not to be counted, even if you could quantify them perfectly. Um, in terms of your second question, um, in terms of subst- they're, they're not yeah. supposed to be counted, they don't, yeah. They wouldn't fit, let's say, in a theoretical framework, but they, you know, that doesn't mean, of course, that Google searches don't have immense values to businesses, let's say, um, that would show up in other ways in terms of, let's say, the quality of their output, um, or higher sales. Um, in terms of the other question, um, in terms of labor saving, so actually that's kind of one thing that we're excited about um, in terms of this conjoint analysis. So Eric's previous work um, that looked at, let's say, the value of the internet, um, the paper with Juhi O, oh, um, they used um, time spent online. Um, and you're right that there's all kinds of services that actually, you know, the, the, the faster or the less time that you spend, actually the more valuable they are. So using um, conjoint analysis to try to get at actually you know, valuing the services themselves or these features themselves, we think might get at a more crisp or direct answer um, to that kind of question rather than proxying uh, through the value through, let's say, just total hours of, of labor. All right. Thanks very much, Adam.